From Hollywood, it's time now for... Johnny Dollar. Lieutenant Garcia, Johnny. Are the boys in the police car still there? There are three police cars here now. They've searched the apartment house from top to bottom. Any luck? No, Eddie got away. I didn't dare make a move to stop him. He was going to shoot his sister. Well, we'll get him, Johnny. Don't worry about it. I don't intend to. My job now is to locate $100,000 worth of stolen furs, not to go after Eddie Money. It's the same job, isn't it? Probably. Did you see that list of his friends Carla gave me? I just put out an APB to bring them in. Good. They weren't all in on that warehouse robbery, but some of them were. If they were, we'll take them. We've got an interrogation room down here to sort the sheep from the goats. Yeah, I know. But first, you've got to catch your goats. Tonight, and every weekday night, Bob Bailey and the transcribed adventures of the band with the action-packed expense account. America's fabulous freelance insurance investigator... Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. From Special Investigator Johnny Dollar, location Los Angeles, California, to the home office, Mono Guarantee Insurance Company, Hartford, Connecticut. Assignment, the Silver Blue Matter. Expense account continued. Item 12, two cents for the way I felt. I hung up the phone and walked to the window, stood there looking out into the street. The police were leaving the apartment to carry their search for fugitive Eddie Monty into wider territory. And Eddie's sister, Carla, sat huddled in a corner, forlorn, beaten, brokenhearted. From the window, too, the view was anything but cheerful. Dirty, cluttered streets lined by row on row of sagging tenements, drab and gray in the weakening light of late afternoon. This was the slums that had spawned Eddie Monty, raised and nurtured him, made him into a member of a gang, and had now sent him fleeing from the police with a gun in his hand. And the same slum had bred the others of the gang, who'd robbed a warehouse of 80 silver blue mink coats, slugged night watchman Albert Grisman into a near-death coma, and had murdered a man who'd tried to give them away. Why, Johnny? What got into him? Why is he ending up this way? I wish I could tell you, Carla. I did something wrong. That's it, of course, but but what? Forget it. You did all you could. It wasn't enough. Well, sometimes nothing is enough. And nobody knows exactly why. I loved him. I I never thought of him as, as just a nuisance of a kid brother, the way a lot of girls do. Now, look. You did more than anybody could expect. You were a pretty young kid when your folks died. Too young to have to take on the responsibility of raising a teenage brother. But I tried. I tried hard, and I thought I was doing all right until lately, but now this... So it didn't work, and what's happened is breaking your heart. Well, that can't be changed. But just remember this one thing. You did the best you could, and that's all anybody could do. So don't blame yourself. Tell me something, Johnny. Yeah? You're wearing a gun. I don't think Eddie knew it when he ran from here. Maybe you couldn't have used it to disarm him. Not when he was on the verge of killing you. But you could have drawn it and killed him. He was careless. He gave you several chances. Why didn't you? I don't know. Thank you, Johnny. I'd like to look through Eddie's room, if you don't mind. All right. I'll go with you. This way, it's down the hall. Thanks. Somehow I still can't believe it. Not the killing, at least. Eddie is just not that kind. Well, a kid gets under pressure sometimes and gets pushed overboard. Maybe we'll know more when they pick him up. What if he... What if he tries to resist arrest? You know the answer to that. Oh, I hope he doesn't. Well, here it is. This has been Eddie's room since he was 13. It ought to tell something. The main thing at the moment is to find something that tells where he might go to hide out. And I've also got $100,000 worth of furs to locate. But you, you go ahead and look around. Whatever you want. Okay, thanks. I'll be in the living room. You, you call me if you want me. For the sake of company, I switched on a beat-up record player in the corner. And I looked at six years of a boy's life, accumulated in one room. Comic books, hot rod magazines, school mementos, knickknacks, photographs. Junk, mostly, to anybody but the owner. I went through all of it, then through the drawers and chest and through his clothes. Nothing. I looked over the photographs stuck in the mirror, tacked on the wall. 
Some of the names on the boys' pictures were the same as those on the list Carla had given to the police. There were a few pictures of girls and a lot of pictures of hot rods. I picked up an envelope of loose photographs lying on the dresser. They were views of a second-hand panel truck, and in all of the pictures, Eddie was standing beside the truck with obvious pride of ownership. One of the views showed the front license plate. I turned the envelope over. The film had been developed less than two weeks before. I called Carla back into the room and asked her about it. No. No, I didn't know he had a car, or a truck, rather. It may not be his, but I'll lay odds that it is. That look on his face is a dead giveaway. I don't know. He sure kept it a secret. He never brought it here once. Do you recognize the background on those pictures? No. No, I don't. It looks like a storage yard or, or an industrial place of some kind, doesn't it? Yeah, I'd call it that. Do you mind if I take these with me? Of course not. But why? The gang had to use something to haul those furs away from the warehouse. But if... If Eddie was keeping the truck a secret from me, it was because he was planning to use it for the robbery. That one or some other one. Johnny... He was in on it all along. Look, Carla, I've got a hunch Eddie is the leader of that gang. Oh, no. I think the truck was used in the robbery, and I think when we find it, we'll find the furs, and we'll find Eddie. See you later, Carla. <laughs> Expense account item 13, $1.85. Taxi fare from Carla's apartment to the police headquarters office of Lieutenant Garcia. Oh, Johnny, I've been trying to locate you. Oh, what's up? We picked up two of those kids on Carla Monte's list. Friends of Eddie's. Wow, that's a start. Not with one of them. He's in the clear. Perfect alibi. We have something on the other one, though. Want to help me talk to him? Yeah, sure. Oh, say, here are some photographs I picked up in Eddie's room a while ago. We should take a look at them, Garcia. All right, let's see them. The pictures were taken about two or three weeks ago. Now, if this truck is his, his sister doesn't know about it. Well, he sure got that owner look on his face. Yeah, he sure has. That second one there shows the license number, see? Yeah, yeah, I see it. You think they might have used this in the robbery, Johnny? It's a possibility. And we're not exactly swamped with angles. I was wondering, too, if you happen to recognize that background behind the truck. No. No, but it looks like it might be down in that area somewhere, the warehouse district. Look, why don't you get some copies made, circulate them, and see if any of your boys can tag the place. Oh, you insurance dicks do get ideas sometimes. Oh, you'd be amazed. All right, I'll do it. And now let's go down and talk to that kid. Interrogation room 519 was on the fifth floor. Bare walls painted gray, a business-like room without a doorman or compromise. Furnished only with the necessary table, chairs, and lights. We stopped in the ante room and looked in through the one-way glass window. The boy waited alone at the interrogation table, trying to put up a tough, defiant front, but failing by the tremble of a lip and the occasional flick of his eyes. Well, let's go in. Get it over with. The kid stiffened when he heard the door open, but he didn't turn around. He just sat there at the table, braced and waiting. You can take that chair at the side, Johnny. Okay, thanks. What's your name? You already know it. I said, what's your name? Mario Santoris. That's your right name? Yeah. Where do you live? Roxman Place, my aunt. Ever been arrested before, Mario? No. Hey, you've got kind of a bad memory, haven't you? Why? September of last year. Arrest made by Officer C.J. Barton. Charge, possession of stolen articles. Hubcap, two auto radios, one camera. I wasn't convicted. I asked if you'd ever been arrested. Not convicted. It was a frame-up. I didn't have any evidence. No, apparently not. Witnesses for the prosecution refused to testify. Case dismissed. Here, what are you going to claim this time, Mario? Another frame-up? I don't know why you brought me in here. I don't know anything about anything. That bad memory again, hmm? I just don't know what you're talking about. It's lucky for us that Eddie Monty had such a good memory, isn't yes, it? Yes. What it's about it. Eddie? Huh? Well, what do you mean? Is he a friend of yours? I know him. He's got a fine memory, that boy. Too bad you can't remember things the way he does. What are you talking about? Oh, that's true, all right. Eddie remembers everything that happened. What he did, what Mario did. I don't know what you mean. Well, that's because of your bad memory, Mario. 
Why, Eddie remembers the name of every boy who was in on that job and just what each one of them did. What job? That warehouse robbery. Have you forgotten about that? I don't know anything about any robbery. Well, there's been a lot of talk. At least you've heard about it, haven't you? I don't know anything about it. Maybe you've just forgotten. I don't know what you're talking about. When did you see Eddie last? I don't remember. Have you seen him since the robbery? No. How can you be sure? You said you hadn't heard of any robbery. I haven't. Still, you haven't seen Eddie since the robbery. Well, I... Come on, Mario. Tell us about it. I guess maybe I did hear about it. So? Well, why shouldn't I hear? It was in the papers. Everybody's been talking about it, so what if I did hear it? I don't prove anything. But you said you hadn't heard. So I forgot. Guy can forget something, can't he? Yeah. If he's got a bad memory, he can. And Mario's got a real bad memory, Johnny. Not Eddie, though. He remembers how you guys loaded those furs into his truck. How you waited across the street in Red Wellers until the prowl car passed. How you slugged the night watchman, Albert Christmas. That's a lie! How do you know it is, Mario? You don't even remember it. Eddie does, though. He even remembers the next night. When you stabbed Red Weller to death to keep him from coming to me. No. No, I didn't do that. Of course you did. You don't think Eddie would lie, do you? It's not true. Makes sense to us. Is Eddie here? You pick him up? How would we know what he remembers unless we picked him up? Now, how do you think we got your name? Out of the telephone book? It's not true what Eddie says. Well, if you've got anything to say, we'll listen to it. But I don't think it's necessary, do you, Johnny? No, I think Eddie remembers everything. Let's get out of here. Yeah. He's lying! You listen to me. I'll tell you the truth. I'll get a stenographer. Now, here's our star to tell you about the final intriguing episode of this week's story. Tomorrow, a cautious search, an ambush, bullets and tears. And the end is violence. Join us, won't you? Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar, starring Bob Bailey, is transcribed in Hollywood. Written by Les Crutchfield, it is produced and directed by Jack Johnstone. Be sure to join us tomorrow night, same time and station, for the next exciting episode of Yours Truly, Johnny Dollar. Roy Rowan speaking.